internets, I am Troy to the Max Extreme. And I'm Ghost Hunter Dave. And together we are Imperious Rex. That's right. Today we're taking another look at Hellboy, but we're we're putting the brakes on the main long form story, and we're gonna take a look at some of the wonderful short stories mm -hmm. that make up a large uh, <laughs> part of the Hellboy yes. collection. Yes. A variety of stories from a slew of artists all chronologically recounting Hellboy's early adventures as a ward of the BPRD mm -hmm. are collected in this new Dark Horse omnibus featuring the first half of the early years of Hellboy. Mm -hmm. printed inconsistently whenever Mike had a story to tell. Their length and publications were pretty varied. Mm -hmm. uh, most were originally published in Dark Horse Presents, and uh, others made up the occasional one-shot or maybe two or three issue mm -hmm. miniseries. Mm -hmm. So this collection kicks off with probably the earliest appearance of Hellboy outside of his initial summoning mm -hmm. in Seed of Destruction, mm -hmm. where a young Hellboy back in 1947, tries pancakes for the first time, yes. thus cementing his choices to renounce his apocalyptic destiny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is a two-page, weird little <laughs> one-off type of thing. Yeah. Originally published in 1999 mm -hmm. and collected here. What do you make of this? It's super cute. <laughs> it is. It's so good. <laughs> I love at the end, too, like, the last few panels is just, like, down in pandemonium. It's like, dear God, <laughs> he's found the love of pancakes. He's tasted the pancake. <laughs> this is truly our darkest hour. Yeah. The demons are outraged. <laughs> that is, like, my favorite part. It is so good. And Hellboy calls them pancakes, which <laughs> oh, just makes geez. it even cuter. What a way to start <sighs> off this, uh... <laughs> this Demon from Hell's yes. apocalyptic saga. So then, moving on, we go to uh, The Midnight Circus, which was originally published as a hardcover graphic novel mm -hmm. in 2013. And this takes place a year after Pancakes. Mm -hmm. This is basically Hellboy running off from the BPRD and stumbling across a weird demonic circus on yeah. the outskirts of town. Yeah which gives him kind of a glimpse at his possible future. Yes. I have never actually read this one before now, because mm -hmm. it's not collected in any of the library editions either. And I was like, I really like when Duncan uh, Fregredo hopped onto the book. Yeah. So this is our first appearance of uh, Duncan Fregredo's artwork right. on our coverage. Yes. And, God, he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Love the artwork he does yeah. here. And I like, too, that it's kind of split. There's, like, just simple line and ink work on, like, the real life stuff. And then the yeah. more surreal stuff has got, like, Painted. an ink wash to yeah. it. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. When uh, young Hellboy goes into the Hall of Mirrors and mm -hmm. sees the glimpse of him in his full, like, demonic horned <laughs> form. Right. That's great. Mm -hmm. He runs across his sister mm -hmm. and um, the bearded demon that he's come across a couple times in the series, Astaroth, mm -hmm. I think is his name. Yeah. Really fun story, uh, fairly brief, and ultimately does a good job of showing Hellboy as a child, uh, vulnerable, with no idea of the fate that awaits him. Mm -hmm. Mike Mignola has been quoted about this story to say, This one owes a lot to Ray Bradbury's Something Wicked This Way Comes, yeah. pretty much his favorite circus story of all time, but even more to Pinocchio, especially all the spooky, disturbing bits Disney left out. <laughs> and the work Duncan is doing here is just flat out amazing. Yeah. Yep, I agree. Yep. Strong Pinocchio uh, <laughs> yes, undercurrent yes. in this. Duncan goes on to say, Ooh. Uh, Growing up is tough enough, even when you don't know the weight of the world rests on the future of your yet diminutive shoulders. Uh, Mike has woven a tale coming of age for the young Hellboy made, all the more poignant for knowing his future. Wonderful, magical, terrifying. This is epic Hellboy on a smaller stage. Very true. That's a good one, Duncan. <laughs> 
hang up my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for calling in. <laughs> Glad to have you aboard. Thanks for the text. Yep. <laughs> So now we jump ahead a bit um, to 1954, England, The Nature of the Beast. Yes. Originally published in Dark Horse Presents in 2000, so six years after The Midnight Circus. And this is a favorite of both ours. Mm -hmm. Hellboy is recruited to the Osiris Club to slay a fabled dragon that is haunting some nearby woods. Mm -hmm. 1,400 years ago, it was driven back by a monk who was killed in the process, but due to the nature of the person and the nature of the place, mm -hmm. lilies sprouted from his blood. Mm -hmm. So Hellboy investigates, mm -hmm. finds the dragon. Mm -hmm. He's nearly killed by him, but he's saved by the serendipitous <laughs> event where the dragon yeah. wraps itself around him, mm -hmm. pinning him to a statue of the monk. Mm -hmm. It cracks the statue and impales the dragon. <laughs> yes. And back, like, in their crystal ball secret room, the club <laughs> the members Osiris are watching. Like, what does this mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> we didn't really plan on that. <laughs> so it leaves them and the viewer and Hellboy just like, so hmm. what? <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Hellboy. Yeah. <laughs> you did it again. <laughs> yep. But then it has this great final panel where Hellboy is walking off, bleeding, mm -hmm. and we get this insert panel of Lily springing up from his blood. Yep. It's one of the most memorable ones. Like, I, the simplicity of the Hellboy stories really sticks into my mind. Yeah. Like, like this one and a few others that I'll bring up later. Yep, exactly. Are the, are the ones that I'm just like, I really like those. Uh-huh. Yeah, and it's different enough from the other ones. Oh, yeah, It's not sure. just like a ghoul or a yeah. tentacled thing. Right. It's like, it's a dragon. They right. call it a dragon, even though it's... A long crocodile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they call it a worm. They call it all kinds of weird things other than what it actually looks like. A stretched out crocodile. <laughs> Next, we move on to 1956 mm -hmm. in the Hellboy canon, mm -hmm. uh, specifically created for the Right Hand of Doom trade paperback that mm -hmm. was released in 2000. We have King Vold. Mm -hmm. This is another, another memorable one for me. It's not a favorite, but it always sticks with me. Yeah. Uh, Hellboy is once again loaned out by Trevor Broom <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to um, meet up with a former colleague named Aikman in Norway who is seeking out the ghost of King Vold, a headless hunter on horseback. Yes. <sighs> a lot of H's there. <laughs> Accompanied by his hounds. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so once Hellboy arrives in Norway, we're treated to this great snapshot of several local legends that mm -hmm. uh, Mignola just recounts so well, and he sets the tone of what's to come. Mm -hmm. This is some of my favorite stuff in the story. It's yeah. like these three or four different local legends, yeah. and they're so bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And told so matter-of-factly. Like, mm -hmm. it's one of the things that I just love about Hellboy. <laughs> it's like, a troll burst up through the chimney. <laughs> Several people saw it. <laughs> <laughs> you just picture this old woman like, Janine across the block saw it. <laughs> I work with so many people like that. It's yeah, sickening. I know. So Hellboy and Aikman yeah. head up to the moors. They immediately come across King Vold. Mm -hmm. Headless is all get out, accompanied by his hounds. Yep. And he says like, on, here. On a horse. On a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and he tells them, watch my, watch this runt of the litter while <laughs> right. I go hunting. Mm -hmm. He can be a bit of a troublemaker. <laughs> right. And he can Aikman's... be a bit of a horse's ass. <laughs> yes. <laughs> bit of a handful. <laughs> a hassle, if you will. <laughs> Hellboy, can you help me? <laughs> this show has gone off the rails. What a weird turn <laughs> we've taken. So Aikman's like, yes, sir, we'd love to help. Mm -hmm. And then it mutates into a giant werewolf, as most things do <laughs> right. in Mignola's stories. Right. Wipes the floor with Hellboy. Yep. And um, right as it's turned its attention to Aikman, the uh, King Vold comes back and he's mm -hmm. like, oh, great job. I just <laughs> right. just captured this mermaid I've been hunting. Um, here, I suppose you want a reward. Uh -huh. And he barfs up some gold <laughs> coins that immediately burn. burn through his hand. <laughs> right through his hands. Yeah. And then he, he like, rides off like... <laughs> 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 While also saying, like, um, fare thee well, Anang on Rama. Uh, so he knows. Oh, he's in the Gives head. him a little wink and a nod. <laughs> it's a, how's your hands? <laughs> Asshole. How's your hands? <laughs> nice hole. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> is any of that usable? <laughs> All right. So now we get into this long spell where yeah. Hellboy spends five months in Mexico yeah. uh, entitled Hellboy in Mexico, parentheses, or a drunken blur. <laughs> yes. And this is kicked off by a one-shot published in 2010, and it gives us our first look, at least in this collection, with uh, Richard Corbin on mm -hmm. art duty. Yep. Someone that is just made for Hellboy. Yes. Uh, yes. So this takes place in 1956 in the Hellboy continuity. And this story is Hellboy recounting a period of lost months as he investigated a rash of supernatural deaths in Mexico only to team up with three luchador brothers mm. who uh, received a holy vision and made it their mission to rid Mexico of evil. Mm -hmm. So that band of uh, heroes killed demons by day and drank themselves stupid by night, only to slip up and have the youngest one get killed by a demonic turkey <laughs> and friends. <laughs> yes. Not only is he killed, he's transformed into this vampiric entity calling himself Kamazats. Yeah. It probably, that's probably a butchered Kamazats! <laughs> but I couldn't say anything else. I'm yeah. not, I don't, my tongue isn't fluid enough for that sort of language. <laughs> yeah. Hellboy finds him in an ancient Aztec temple and is forced to wrestle him to the death mm -hmm. in a ring surrounded by the undead. It ends with Hellboy impaling him on a uh, ring post, mm -hmm. instantly killing him but saving his soul. And from then on, Hellboy wanders the Mexican landscape in a drunken blur, trying to forget the trauma. Mm -hmm. Good one. It is good. Yeah. A lot of turns in it. I yes. like it a lot. Yeah, also, a lot I, happens in this one. Yes. I really also love luchadors. So yes. <laughs> when I heard that Hellboy went to Mexico, it's like, if he's not drinking with luchadors, don't even fucking call me. And he is. Oh. So you did. <laughs> yeah. I love when Hellboy just teams up with somebody. Yeah. And just gets along famously with them. And it's like, I love that like in like lore, like luchadors are like super Mexican superheroes. Mm -hmm. So him to go down to Mexico, befriend like a group of luchadors to fight evil at night and yes. drink and just <laughs> oh. be like best buds ever. Yeah. Like, why isn't that in any of the movies? <laughs> yeah, oh, I know. <laughs> why isn't that every cowboy comic? <laughs> well, for a while it almost was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Yeah. I also love at the end of this. We get a look at this old-timey wrestling film featuring somebody <laughs> playing Hellboy. Yes, yeah. So, like, he went on to be this staple in Mexican <laughs> yeah. wrestling. Yeah. So after that, we get a real quick one-off uh, published in 2011 called Hellboy vs. the Aztec Mummy, mm -hmm. which is uh, just expanding on Hellboy's five-month drunken weekend where mm -hmm. he runs across a shape-shifting mummy. It's uh, recounted by several Mexican consultants vouching for the authenticity of the story. <laughs> yeah. So much that, like, these word balloons take up half the page. <laughs> yeah. it's, they're just going on and on about this. Right. And I, one of them is in a luchador mask yeah. in, like, a suit and tie. Yeah. I liked it, though. Because yeah. it's just a small little snippet, and then at the end, it's just these two dudes with this huge exposition. It's like... And I agree with them. It happened. It checks out. It, yeah. I was there, man. You yeah. don't even know. Yeah. yeah, and we get Mignola back on this. Yep. Yep. After that, we have a, uh, a one called Hellboy Gets Married, published in 2013. Another short adventure in Mexico where Hellboy inadvertently marries a vampire bride during his drunken tenure down south. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is illustrated by Mick McMahon. Mm -hmm. um, not a huge favorite of mine in the Hellboy canon. Right. Uh, a little too cartoony for my tastes. It did come off like a little, like of an animated style mm -hmm. rather than like a, what we've already been looking at, like Magnolia or Corbin or yeah, Fibrero. maybe not shadowed enough. Yeah, like I don't know, it felt like something was missing, like it was a little unfinished. Mm -hmm. um, this one is a little forgettable for me, despite that it's kind of has lasting repercussions down the road, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it should be a fairly memorable story. I. I've read it a couple times, and I never remember it when I get to it. Yeah. I don't know. I It's okay. Maybe For, a different artist would have made it more impactful, but... What I can remember, this might have been the first time I've read it, but I could have been just like you. Maybe I <laughs> yeah. read it a bunch of times. I don't remember. Who knows? But yeah, I wanted to also bring up, too, uh, now it seems like the perfect time, like, there's a, a slew of artists throughout all of these shorts, too, mm -hmm. and it, it, uh, it really shows that when Mignola's on the book... Like, how different of a tone it, yeah. it is. 
Yeah. Because, like, not that the others are, uh, have, like, different, or bad storytelling, rather, but they mm. have just different. But you don't get those, like, weird inserts of oh. just, like, a statue or a bust or something. Yeah. Just to set, like, an ambiance, it's, like, almost just straight up. A deer head drooling blood. Yeah, <laughs> like, none of that stuff. So, like, th if that's the only thing that's really kind of missing that I really like in a Hellboy book. Mm -hmm. But, like, not to say, like, I don't like it. No, I will say Fagredo, I think, kind of captures that yeah. pretty well. I think he has the same panel layout as Mignola does. Right. But a lot of the other ones, I don't feel like they capture it like he does. Right. Mignola's always seems darker and more sinister to mm -hmm. me, which makes, like, the offhanded humor so much more impactful to me <laughs> when it happens. Yeah. And then in something like this one, for instance, it seems too goofy to me. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I can see that. Because just the layouts don't feel as sinister mm -hmm. as how Mignola draws them. But then when you get like somebody like Corbin, like he does a oh, chunk. The whole thing feels <laughs> like, should I be reading this? <laughs> yeah, he's got like... It feels really evil. He doesn't do any of those inserts or anything either. But like he does this whole, a, a big stint of Hellboy in Mexico. Yeah. And... He bookends it. Yeah, and it feels right for it yeah and then he also does like other stories later that are like really creepy and like it totally fits and now i couldn't even see i guess mignola doing those no so i don't know next up uh two quick ones that kind of go hand in hand the coffin man published in 2014 as part of hellboy day celebration yeah uh, this features Hellboy tracking down a local Mexican sorcerer who reanimates dead bodies and makes them his slaves. Hellboy attempts to save a young girl's deceased uncle, but ends up getting his ass kicked by the coffin <laughs> man's mutated donkey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is drawn by Fabio Moon. Yes. Yeah. This was good. Yes. It's brief. Yeah. Not a whole lot to it. No. Nope. Just it's fun. Yep. Yep. And then it's followed up. Uh, the next year, 2015, by Coffin Man 2, the rematch in uh, Dark Horse Presents number 200. Mm -hmm. So this one, Hellboy tracks down the Coffin Man to his extra-dimensional shack, mm -hmm. only to be bested <laughs> once more and momentarily turned into a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> only to wake up naked in the desert. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Wondering, where are my pants? <laughs> And I like that this one is also illustrated by Gabriel Ba, Fabio yes. Moon's brother. Yep, twin brother. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. They're always together. I know. You, know, you can't separate them. Right. I feel like they just take one paycheck <laughs> <laughs> and divvy it up between them. <laughs> These guys both work in the Mignolaverse yeah. in uh, BPRD, uh, like, the 40s. Oh, do they? Okay. And I think they do a vampire book as well. They fit right in. Oh, they're perfect. Yeah. Yep. And, I mean, it goes without saying... They do the amazing graphic novel, Day Tripper. Yes. And everyone should read that yes. because it's one of the best ever. Yes. Yep. So that brings us on to the bookend of Hellboy's Time in Mexico, House of the Living Dead, published again as an original hardcover, this mm -hmm. one in 2011, mm -hmm. and uh, features the return of Richard Corbin to wrap up the tale. Yes. So in this, Hellboy is now making a living as a masked luchador wrestler, <laughs> and he's coerced to a mysterious castle under the pretense that he needs to save a kidnapped girl. Yep. When he arrives, he encounters a mad scientist and his hunchbacked helper, <laughs> yeah. and he is uh, basically forced to wrestle a Frankenstein monster <laughs> yeah. in a makeshift wrestling ring <laughs> yeah. in the middle of this laboratory. I loved it. <laughs> it is so good. It, it's literally like a collection of ideas that Mignola loves. Yeah. And like, let's just put them all together. Just throw it all in there. <laughs> Mexican wrestling, <laughs> Frankenstein, mad scientist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be a story. It all works. Yep. Basically, wrestle for the doctor's amusement. Yeah, <laughs> no real much. reason. Yeah. Yeah. The woman's life is <laughs> at your hands, Hellboy. You must win this match to save her life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> Hellboy dukes it out with the monster for a while before all hell breaks loose and uh, the castle erupts in flames. He attempts to save the kidnapped girl, but she is... Immediately killed by a werewolf <laughs> yeah. who shoots her with a pistol <laughs> of all ways of murder. Thought you think I was going to bite you. Yeah. <laughs> Pull out a werewolf gun. Yeah. And uh, if that wasn't enough, then a resurrected vampire makes an appearance yeah. only to be immediately, immediately shut killed. down. <laughs> but um, he's replaced by his vampiric brides. Yep. Who are then also shut down. <laughs> yes. And the castle caves in on Hellboy. Yes. As it usually does. Yes. 
And that about wraps it up there. Right. He ends up stumbling to this deserted bar, mm -hmm. orders a, a whiskey or a tequila, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, yeah, yeah. when in Rome. Maybe a, a mezcal. Ooh, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> and then the, the door opens, he makes it too, because the Frankenstein monster walks in. Oh, yeah, he does. And the two just have like a little heart to heart. Yep. Yeah. I also like too when uh, he wakes up from his a bit of his drunken stupor. Yeah. That the bar is like deserted and full of cobwebs again because yeah. that's an ongoing theme too in the oh, rest yeah. of the series. Yep. And as he walks outside, he sees a ghostly funeral procession of the little girl that he failed to save. Mm -hmm. And then Astroth makes another appearance, and he tells him, "You choose to live a man's life, live and suffer like a man. You can do that, but you will never be a man." You will never know the peace of the grave. You were born from hell and bound for hell in the end. Oof. Heavy shit. Yeah. Hellboy, <laughs> Hellboy really gets shit on during his time in Mexico. <laughs> pretty much. And that pretty much wraps it up. You mm -hmm. assume he uh, presumably heads back to the States after that, or he's mm -hmm. picked up by the BPRD. Mm -hmm. You don't really know, because the next arc, The Crooked Man, mm -hmm. takes place two years later. And we never know what happens in that gap. It's no. still unexplored. Yeah. Even the, the Hellboy and the BPRD 1950 whatever titles, they stop right now at this gap. Oh, really? At 56, mm. I think. So you don't know what happens from mm. Hellboy in Mexico to the Crooked Man. Hmm. So I'm sure oh. they'll explore it at some point, but they've left it open. Fun. Yep. <laughs> Which brings us to the Crooked Man, another very memorable yes, Hellboy story. Right. This is a three-issue mini published in 2010, and features Hellboy encountering witchcraft and a demonic minion in the Appalachian Mountains. Yes. One of the few stories set in America. So I feel I think he mentions that he's just passing through. I wonder if he's like traversing up from Mexico back That's to what Connecticut I was too, because I think the BPRD HQ is in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's like a two-year span where he's just walking the earth. Cool. Solo. That would be good. Yeah. Yeah. And he uh, runs across uh, witchcraft and meets up with a guy that used to be from that area. He took mm -hmm. off for a while and he came back named Tom Farrell. And the two set out to undo the damage caused by the crooked man and his brethren. Mm-hmm. This one gives me nightmares <laughs> it's the mixture of just like being maybe too close to home <laughs> i i don't know and just richard corbin's like creepy oh, art yeah the crooked man is freaking me out any single panel he's in oh. i just hate the way he looks so crooked <laughs> i it, it freaks me out and i but I love this story. Yeah, this is Corbin at his best with creepy witchcraft, rustic forests and shanties, and unarguably the most unsettling Hellboy villain to date. Uh, also has some great moments like when Hellboy stumbles on the skin of a witch who is slinked off into the woods in the form of a raccoon, <laughs> and then she crawls back into the skin through the mouth and like just cracks herself back together. God! Oh, and that, that poor horse <laughs> <laughs> that was Tom's father. Yeah, that has just been dad. like, yeah, <laughs> ridden to death. <laughs> just this exasperated horse God. that falls apart as soon as she floats off him into the skies. <laughs> and uh, the woman that bursts into bugs. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I also love when they come across the uh, church, they meet this blind priest that's yeah. just been out there. And I just kept expecting him to turn on him. Yeah. Because that's usually how things go <laughs> right. in Hellboy's right. uh, encounters. Right. But I really like that he, he held true to his faith. Yeah, I like that too. And he like he said no to the crooked man's offerings mm -hmm. and he even blessed a shovel for Hellboy to take out there <laughs> to and start lopping off heads. <laughs> One of the best Hellboy shorts. Yeah. Without a doubt. Really love it. Yep. So that brings us to... Malaysia in 1958, where we meet the Penangalan. Penangalan. Yes. How'd you find that pronunciation? I just tried to get it into that world, and I know my wife has visited there, and they have a lot of ong um sounds. Really? Okay. Yeah, so that's how I put it together. All right. Not how I would have uttered it, but <laughs> no. uh, all right. <laughs> Penangalan. Penangalan. Yes. Or not. Let it's us know very, if we're very be, wrong. It could be very wrong, but that's how I put it together. Right. No Sherlock fucking Holmes over here. <laughs> so this was originally published in 2004, and uh, yeah, this is Hellboy going to Malaysia 
to investigate a monster with one of the strangest origins of yeah. any Hellboy story. Yeah. Oh my god, I love the origin. I had to read it twice because I'm like, what? What? <laughs> An old woman was startled and she accidentally kicked off her own head. And then... Doesn't tell you what she was startled by. No. And then her head and guts flew into the trees. <laughs> yeah, it became a demon. Yeah. <laughs> called the Penangala. <laughs> yes. So Hellboy comes across this monster disguised as a little girl at this point. Mm -hmm. um, gets wrapped up in its guts. <laughs> yep. Fights it for what seems to be a long time. <laughs> like from sundown to sun up. Uh -huh. And then bursts out of the cave that she's inhabiting. And she bursts into flames. Yep. The end. That's it. Typical Hellboy ending. <laughs> All right, and now we're coming up on the home stretch with one of the most recognizable Hellboy stories of all time. Mm -hmm. Originally published in two-page installments for Capital City's Advanced Comics Catalog. <laughs> what? <laughs> Good for you, Capital City. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Issues 75 through 82 in 1995. A year later, Mike went back, added a new opening page, as well as eight additional page uh, conclusion. Hmm as it was reprinted into a single issue. I'm talking, of course, about The Corpse. Mm. A story so good, you get it tattooed on your back. <laughs> <laughs> Believed by many, Mignola included to be one of the greatest quintessential Hellboy stories of all time. Mm -hmm. Straightforward, uh, features Irish lore, big monsters, haunted graveyards, and many threads that play out further down the road in the Hellboy legacy. Um, I read something where Mignola ended up really loving this after having it be like one of his least favorite stories he's written yeah and maybe it's became out in a weird format and he's like oh whatever that sucks he put it together and it became one of his favorites yeah well the fact that he had to craft it into two page installments yeah. seems yeah. like wow you really got to have like a theme going with this <laughs> you can break it up into chunks like that right um, it, I could totally see leaving that and being like, I don't know if that worked. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it is a quintessential Hellboy story. Yeah. So many great iconic moments, mm -hmm. uh, many of which came right out of the, uh, or went into the movies. Yep. The corpse in the movie. Yep. Fantastic. Yeah. One of my favorite parts. Yep. <laughs> so this one takes place in 1959. Hellboy's searching for a missing baby that has been stolen by fairies. He makes a deal with some familiar looking goblin men mm -hmm. in which uh, if he buries a corpse for them, they will return the child. Hellboy treks across several cemeteries, all with their own supernatural occurrences that mm -hmm. keep him at bay, before <laughs> finally finding a suitable place to bury him. Mm -hmm. Straightforward, uh, very much like a Neil Gaiman style fable, yeah. where he's got three places he has to go mm -hmm. and the first one doesn't work, yeah. or maybe it's a three bears type of story, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> A couple things of note, uh, Dagda, the king of the fairies, is first introduced in this, and he is one of the trio that observes Hellboy overcoming his destiny as the beast of the apocalypse mm -hmm. in Wake the Devil, along with Baba Yaga mm -hmm. and Edward Grey. The Little Men are also responsible for delivering the Iron Maiden to Rasputin mm -hmm. in Wake the Devil, and the fairy that he uh, initially impersonates a stolen baby and later awakens the monstrous pig beast mm -hmm. is Graugach. Graugach. I never know how to say that. Yeah. Who returns towards the end of the Hellboy series with a serious vendetta as a result of becoming trapped in a shrimpy pig body in this story. He? <laughs> he is pissed. <laughs> you did it to yourself, Graugach. <laughs> If that is how you say your name. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we also get baby Alice, the stolen child, uh, who goes on to play a huge role in the series. As I it totally forgot its about that. Oh my yeah, God. Almost becoming a love interest of Hellboy yeah. as she grows up, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, a very important story in the Hellboy lore. Mm -hmm. Probably... Mike, I'm assuming, had no idea as he wrote this <laughs> was what was going to spring up from it, but... As it winds down, there's like four important threads that all stem from this. Yes. A couple other great moments. I love the ghost of the hangman that appears right at midnight I and love directs that him where to go. That panel layout, perfection. That is so cinematic, the way mm -hmm. it looks. I just, I would love to see that in a movie. It's like him looking at his watch and then boom, like it's it. just there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that arm. Yeah, that arm outstretches. <laughs> 
I love that he's got like an old just dad watch too, you know? Yeah. It's not like, <laughs> yeah. it's, not like anything. it's just an old Timex. Exactly. You know? <laughs> There's nothing BRP, PRPD issued it's or not, anything. It's not Zinco, so it hasn't exploded yet. <laughs> I also like that the fairies and the supernatural creatures in this are dwelling on the approaching dawn of their kind. Mm. Uh, so they're, they're feeling like they're about to be replaced and forgotten about forever, mm -hmm. which is a little sad. And um, it definitely the inspiration for the second Hellboy movie, uh, oh, The Golden sure. Army. Yeah. Next up, Double Feature of Evil. Originally published in 2010, taking place in 1960. Mm -hmm. This is a strange collection mm -hmm. of two short stories presented as a double feature, playing at a dilapidated <laughs> movie theater and watched by zombie patrons. Right. I love that wraparound. I love that too because... <laughs> I would love if every Hellboy story started <laughs> and ended that way. Ever, so when the first part ends, like the, the zombies in there, I could just imagine being like... <laughs> And just like continue to watch on, and, and then at the end they're like, <laughs> yeah. like a, just a few of our clapping. Uh -huh. It just makes me happy. Oh, it's <laughs> just it's happy zombies. Perfect atmosphere. Yeah. You know, Hellboy, as we've said before, just excels at the atmosphere, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. that right off the bat right. is so good. It's like three pages right at the beginning, yeah. dedicated to something that does not bear any no it's got like doesn't it have like all the universal monster posters yes like, it has like frankenstein mm -hmm. mummy wolfman mm -hmm. love it mm -hmm. so good yeah i like that more than the stories themselves <laughs> oh yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> so the first short is called sullivan's reward and it's about hellboy investigating a haunted house that has been uh possessing its owner into feeding it homeless people in return for gold yeah Hellboy is able to destroy the house by piercing the heart of this enormous giant corpse creature <laughs> yeah. below the floorboards. Um, right after the owner is crushed to death by an enormous pile of gold that is dispersed to him when he tries to feed Just Hellboy to the house. a pallet of gold coins down the <laughs> yes. stairs. Something that Scrooge McDuck could just jump into and swim around. <laughs> or maybe a cautionary tale for Scrooge the McDuck. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Don't feed your nephews to a haunted house. <laughs> Not what I was thinking, but okay. <laughs> still, uh, still, still works, though. Good words to live by. <laughs> then the next one is so short, I almost forget about it every time I read this. Yep. The House of Sebek. Hellboy stops a crazed museum worker who's commanding an army of resurrected mummies. Uh, the villain is then eaten by a statue of Sebek, the Egyptian crocodile god, mm -hmm. when he accidentally prays to Horus while in the House of Sebek. You don't do that. And this is like four pages, maybe? Yeah. yeah. You gotta get more time in that theater with yeah. the zombies. But those zombies loved it. They oh, applauded they, after they love that one. one. <laughs> they like a, sh a short, <laughs> tight story. They like when something eats something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so we finally made it, Troy. The one I've been waiting for this whole time. Yeah, the finish line is in sight. The iron shoes are on our feet. <laughs> clank, clank, clank. <laughs> we have reached the Troy Potter favorite Hellboy story. Mm. Uh, the iron shoes. Yes. Last story in the collection. One of the shortest. Yep. Uh, originally published in 1996 as a backup of the reprinting of The Corpse, mm -hmm. because when that was published in a single issue, it was just short of uh, the page count. Oh. And they're like, ah, we need something quick to throw in here. <laughs> and apparently he liked, Mike liked the sound of The Corpse and the Iron Shoes. Oh, nice. So well, here we go. Let me just come up with the best story I've ever written. <laughs> <laughs> As he licks the tip of his pen <laughs> and jots down gold. Uh. <laughs> would you like to take it here? <laughs> <laughs> you bet I would. Okay. So it starts with uh, a recounting of how these fairies are like allergic to iron, except for these certain few. And <laughs> Hellboy... Most fairies are, but not these but ones. not this one. <laughs> So he is sent to Ireland, mm -hmm. and uh, there is a bit of trouble going in this little tower, so Hellboy goes to investigate, only to immediately find a little goblin creature wearing <laughs> iron shoes, yep. in which he almost just jumps straight out a window, <laughs> and Hellboy nooses him right quick, only to be pulled out by the weight of probably those iron shoes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Heavy buggers. <laughs> only to... Uh, 
pretty much rodeo tie him up down on the ground, drag him into the city, where he, like, just throws him into a church. <laughs> where he, like, burns up, and then the priest keeps his shoes yeah. just for a present. Exactly. <laughs> it's so good. It's, <laughs> it's just right to the point. Yeah. It encapsulates Hellboy so well. Mm -hmm. Love the, the monster's quote as he <laughs> leaps at him. He says, live or die, win or lose, best beware. My iron shoes! <laughs> <laughs> and, <it> just... <laughs> mm -hmm. and then once Hellboy has uh, thrown him, stoned him, yep. and uh, the priest is like, would you be wanting these iron shoes, my lad? <laughs> and Hellboy's like, nah, you hold on to him, Padre. I'm traveling light. <laughs> and then just sets off. Onto whatever Some whirlwind adventure. Exactly, right? <laughs> just goes off onto the road. Yep, and uh, that's where we're gonna leave it. Yeah, in 1961 is where we leave off. Mm -hmm. So that marks the end of the complete short stories volume one, as collected in the most recent Dark Horse Omnibus. Yes. So check back with us as we examine volume two, which takes us from 1961 to present and after that we're gonna jump back in to the long form storytelling which brings us closer to Hellboy's final apocalyptic destiny yes indeedy have you been enjoying our our hell year so far Troy I have me too yeah I I've read it so many times it's almost like Watchmen where when I go to read it again I'm like am I gonna enjoy this mm -hmm. I, I know it in and out and then I sit down and I just love it. Yeah. It's just so good. <laughs> um, and I'm enjoying it actually reading it chron chronologically too. Mm -hmm. I think when we did our first initial Hellboy stories, we brought it up like, is there a collection that does this chronologically? Because it jumps around a lot in the library editions or yeah. even when it like came out, you know, as it as is. Yeah. It was one of the cool things about Hellboy that it could just take place at any point in time. Right. They had so many uh missing years between their stories that you could just jump in and throw in some weird little adventure yeah but watch or reading them all in order is really fun to see yeah, how they is. play out because they did take the time to make sure that everything uh worked out yes and did tell like a concise or like a complete story yes. as it progressed yeah if you would like to, you could join us on to Patreon, where That's we right. do special perks such as a twice-monthly podcast and a slew of other things for different tiers. That's that you right. can uh, just hear me and Dave talk more about stuff. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, join us next time for more comic goodness. Until then, I've been Short of the Match Extreme. And I've been Ghost Hunter Dave. And we've been Imperious Rex. We'll see you next time. Imperious Rex. Imperious Rex. Imperious Rex. Imperious Rex, Imperious Rex, Imperious Rex, Imperious Rex, Imperious Rex, Imperious Rex, Imperious Rex.